Uh, welcome everyone to ITS meeting, uh, ITS workshop. The title of today's workshop is um, Quantum Information in Chemistry. Uh, so it has been about more than uh, four years since the quantum information really uh, start, the field of quantum information uh, started. So it has promise and also many issues, but I think it now it has evolved to the level that uh, quantum information going forward will have significant impact on in the field of uh, theoretical and computational chemistry. So in that regard, um, I'm really happy that we have invited four uh, leading experts who can talk about different aspects of quantum information, uh, broadly speaking, but more specifically for quantum computation. Um, so without further ado, so let me uh, first introduce uh, Alan Asprobuzik. So he is now at the University of Toronto. Um, Alan, thank you. And why don't you go ahead and uh, start your presentation? Thank you. First of all, uh, I just want to say, because I've been doing it in the chat, but uh, so many people that I know in the room that I really uh, care and, and had a lot of fun talking to in person, uh, like David and Dorothy and Jacob Krish and others have been mentioning, uh, I miss you all. Uh, and hopefully one, one day after the seven variants are coming, uh, we can see each other in person. Okay, so I toast to that, my diet code. Oh, um, by the way, uh, if you have any question, short question, please send as chat. Yeah. And then so, we'll have a chance to talk. Uh, Alan will have a chance to answer them. Okay. I, have, I was asked to speak for 20 minutes and then have, um, have um, 10 minutes of questions and this just started, okay? So this is a intro talk to this audience. Um, it is amazing, right? Uh, Daniel in this room wrote the first paper on simulation of quantum dynamics uh, in 2004, I think. And then 2005, we published a paper in chemistry. And since then uh, it's been 16 years um, and a lot of things have happened. So. Firstly, uh, I like to always start thinking about uh, how important are simulators. This is a classical simulator that simulated the motion of the planets. Digital simulators uh, basically enable our world. Chips are designed by chips. I'm gonna end with that in this talk. So remember the concept. You cannot design a computer chip right nowadays without using computer chips. So computers enable our existence beyond, you know, the digital realm, they enable the physical realm. So this is Samuel Boyce, the advisor of the advisor of the advisor of my advisor. Okay, He's, he is also bold like me. And he did the first quantum chemistry calculation on a classical computer. This is the EDSAC. Uh, and this calculation was done in 1955. The era that we are on in quantum computing is not very dissimilar to this, okay? Um, but what he showed is, um, he produced a paper tape where a computer program uh, predicted the properties of molecules. Um, you can see there what his student, John Popol, uh, wrote about that. So um, now we hark back to another giant besides uh, Samuel Boyce. Um, he, we're talking now Richard Feynman, his most cited paper. is a paper that, that basically uh, predates and starts uh, well, we get together with work from other people like Bennett and, and and other people, contemporaries of him, starts the idea of quantum computing, but also the idea of quantum simulation. Uh, I want to say that the ads of Apple have gone downhill dramatically since this beautiful ad of Richard Feynman. Now this is how an ad on Af of Apple looks like. So I think uh, we've done, gone downhill. So uh, you, you heard, many of you in this room have heard me talk about this a long time. So this is in some sense a review. But for the new people here, uh, a quantum computer has an advantage over a classical computer because it allows you to map quantum information to a quantum processor that can handle quantum information natively, okay? That in terms of quantum simulation, and this is known, and another thing I want you to notice is this flat line here. We'll, we'll show you this flat line again. This is the flat line of exact simulation as a function of time. This is a prediction from 2008 that still holds, time, holds its own. And the idea of quantum simulation is that Long-term algorithms are proven to show, uh, you know, like algorithms that will use error correction will have a polynomial advantage uh, uh, 
solving the, so the, the, the Schrodinger equation exactly. And in the near term, we're in this regime of approximations. They're also polynomial in time, but we cannot say we're solving the, the, the problem exactly within a basis. Um, so again, this is kind of like a very vintage slide. Uh, it's the same slide I used 15 years ago. And uh, what you see here is uh, the very simple, uh, the very simple algorithm that allows you to calculate the energy of a quantum system by propagating it in time and using a quantum Fourier transform to go from the time domain to the frequency domain. Uh, this is so-called phase estimation. And what still holds from this early, 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 early ancient work is that the number of uh, qubits will be proportional uh, to the number of spin orbitals in the problem. I mean. We'll come back to that because that's an important topic during this talk. Okay, what happened since then? Obviously, now we are in the noisy intermediate scale quantum computers, a term coined by John Preskill. These are machines that have some degree of coherence and certain number of qubits, um, and then control precision that defines something that IBM likes to call quantum volume. I just like to simplify it as an area, number of qubits times number of gates that you can do before the coherence. Just to give you an idea, more qubits, more, more number of gates is what matters. But now what, it's, uh, what has been crazy, I never imagined, I was gonna be involved in a review paper every year about this field. And you might say, Alana, you're crazy. Why are you writing a review paper every year, right? What the heck is going on? Well, uh, with this, former co-founders of Separa Computing, several of my grad students and postdocs, uh, we wrote this uh, review paper of, uh, based on a workshop actually the NSF organized. And I remember, uh, I'm pretty sure Sugi was there and I think Daniel as well. So we organized a workshop around 2016 or so or 17, we wrote this review paper. And then uh, uh, I was invited by Simon Benjamin for a physics version of it. But then you say, wait, what, how about one year later, Alan just puts another one, right? What, what's going on? Well, the reason we put out this, this review paper, which by the way, was just accepted two days ago or two days ago in reviews of modern physics. Thank you reviewers, probably one of the reviewers or two are here in this room. So I cheer to you. Uh, we really try to be encyclopedic and figure out what can you do with a near-term intermediate scale quantum computer or a noisy intermediate scale quantum computer. And uh, we, we were lucky enough to pro propose one of the first two algorithms for these machines, the variational eigen solver. Farhi proposed a quantum optimization algorithm. And since then we've been proposing myself and many, 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 many other groups, all sorts of different algorithms. Not all the algorithms for MISC computers are variational, but many are, and variational algorithms optimize a particular loss function. It could be the energy of a system, and then it looks at the variational principle, but it could also be a loss function for machine learning. Now, this is the reason we wrote the review. Even though I lead a rather large group on quantum computing, we were lost in the literature. And you can see why. 2019 and 2020 papers just listed here, okay? Most of them. Of course, these are all the developments in variational algorithms, but variational algorithms exploded around 2018, 19, 20. So we are making a digital version of this review that, that hopefully updates the RepMod fees forever. A GitHub-based interactive review. So one of my grad students is actually working on that platform so that we all can together finally have a, a review that doesn't die and we all can put it together, kind of like Wikipedia, right? Because it took us forever to start it. Now let's continue it together as a community. But these are all the algorithms that have to do with quantum simulation. And uh, I like the fact that uh, I see the camera of David Cocker there. Uh, he's an expert in quantum dynamics. So non-equilibrium, uh, excited state dynamics, pro problems that interest him. Many people are already working on those type of simulations. Um, problems related to uh, quantum machine learning are pretty popular. There's some work from many people over there listed some uh, from my group as well. And then uh, also optimization, big problem. And now these two that you see here, I think are gonna be more and more important. So for the John graduate students in the audience, I recommend you all to look at quantum computers as accelerators, basically how can a quantum computer do linear algebra-like tasks? How can a quantum computer can do finance? Those are two very exciting topics. Obviously you cannot get all the, all the vectors or all the matrices from the linear algebra or all the eigenvalues, you will have to extract them in a observable sense. You might be able to get some observable based on those vectors. But if you can use a black box that does that, then you can imagine having a lot of algorithms enabled by quantum computers. Finally, of course, there's algorithms for control, for consistent histories, for nuclear physics. So 
I think really I invite people to go to this review and it's almost like a menu in a restaurant. You want to learn something about quantum computing, go in there. It's, it's exciting. And I'm really excited about the field. So what is a variational algorithm, right? So I've been talking about them and the, the way you want to think about them is think of a guitar, right? When you, when you play a guitar, you measure it, right? The guitar just plays back at you some tunes, right? In the quantum mechanics, obviously what happens is a little bit more complicated. You project a particular operator, right? But tuning the guitar means changing the, the frequency at the, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the strings are, 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 are tuned to and also uh, changing perhaps where you place your fingers. This is not solely similar to changing the placing, placement of the gates and the angles that the gates are, 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 are used. Okay, So it is a stencil for a circuit as well as the parameters for the circuit that are variationally changed okay, and optimized um, externally in a quantum computer. That's a variational algorithm. And even in the original paper, again, I'm trying to show you many pictures from the original papers. We believe we're the first ones to say QPU in a paper. Actually, Jarrod McLean was telling me QPU, and I was like, ah, come on, man, that sounds really terrible. Turns out QPU is now very used, but also it's a very important point I'm going to make for the rest of this talk. You can imagine that it's going to be useful to have a room full of quantum computers. So whenever you see these timings for variational algorithms that say, this is take 72 days on a, on a variational algorithm, I think people are not realizing would you, if you had 72 ion traps in a room, you could do it in a day because our original algorithms are embarrassingly parallel. So whenever you see a timing, remember that. That's another lesson, okay? So what, 72 days on a computer doesn't mean anything uh, if you have more than one, right? So just, just remember that. So since then, a lot of things happen. For example, we wrote this package called Tequila that I invite everybody here to play with. Okay, there are many packages that do things like this, but Tequila is a very high level package that uh, is standing on the shoulders of giants, um, you know, by SEF, Psi, Open Fermion, JAX, etc., and also all the simulators that allows you really to simulate Hamiltonians, machine learning problems, etc., at an extremely high level. And this is the brainchild of Jacob Kotman. And Jacob is looking for faculty positions. So if you have any faculty position on there you had or your dean has one, you give it to Jacob Gottman, and it's going to be the most important thing you can do. The most important thing you learn in this talk is that, okay? So Jacob uh, uh, wrote this code with many people in my lab. And this is an example of a beautiful way, you know, you can just, in few lines of code, uh, simulate the, 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 the benzene molecule, okay? So now, what are the things that you can do with tools like Tequila and other advanced tools from other groups on other, on other universities? Remember, I'm going to start coming back to a, look, a lot of the things I mentioned until you to remember. Remember the spin orbitals. Spin orbitals are expensive. A qubit is an expensive thing, whereas bits are so cheap. So why not do the best possible quantum chemistry to prepare the best possible adapted wave function? And that's what you map to the quantum computer. You don't map a crappy Hartree-Fock reference. That's committing suicide. So in this paper of 2021, we have this model where we use uh, multi-resolution analysis in the madness code, by the way, developed. Uh, very close to you guys. Uh, that's developed uh, by, by Harrison, um, which is now at uh, Stony Brook. And um, pernatural orbitals from a NP2 based on that are used then as the basis for the quantum chemistry. And by using the right orbitals, you can reduce the cost that it takes to do a complete basis set simulation on a quantum computer by a factor of 10, five, to 10 or so. You can really see here, sometimes two, okay? It's hard to tell you a number, number, but you can see the range here in the, in the black is the extrapolated basis set limit simulations for these small molecules compared to the very large number of qubits that you will need if you use hard refock. I'm gonna skip this. Um, very important thing, I would say, is uh, gradients. So Jacob also with uh, Abhinav Banand in my lab, and notice that people had already noticed how to calculate gradients of quantum circuits by thinking of the eigenvalue spectrum of the operators of the gates. So what Jacob did, which I think is brilliant, is can we look, and this all credit goes to Jacob, right? Um, basically, let's look at this spectrum of the many build operators themselves, and then based on their spectral properties, obtain a gradient. And it turns out he can get the gradient of any many body operator, in four evaluations. And if you restrict yourself to real ones, 
uh, real wave functions, then you will need only two evaluations, which is incredible, right? Because the, that means that you don't have this exponential growth in the number of terms that you need to look at when, once you expand that many body operator in terms of its order, order in, in, in simple uh, spin uh, operators. So this really, really, really opened the door to many body gradients in quantum computers. Um, I'm looking at my time. So let me see. Even though I simplified my talk a lot, I have seven minutes left. Okay, so let me tell you another story. So what are we in terms of um, hardware? This is a paper from 2016. We did the hydrogen molecule uh, in the first Google quantum computer. This is work by Ryan Babush and uh, Peter O'Malley and many others. And you can see here something very nice. We're comparing the variation ligand solver to the actual full phase estimation. Full phase estimation was able to be done in that such a small system, but you can see how because it requires more gates and more operations is more noisy, even though in principle it will be exact. And I untrap quantum computer here, 2018 in PRX. Uh, then that was our work together with uh, Rainer Blatt. Now you can see here the beautiful IBM paper uh, from 2017. It's still my favorite paper in the sense that it has uh, orbitals painted on top of a barium hydrate molecule. And I just saw today this morning in Twitter that IBM opened a challenge for everybody, grad students in the room, to simulate a foresight Heisenberg model on this machine. So they have a challenge and a prize for the person that simulates the best for, uh, foresight Heisenberg model on the same computer. So let's see what people come up with. Okay. Um, IonQ now is a company that went public, uh, had a paper in quantum chemistry in three qubits. And the state of the art is a 12 qubit experiment by Google that simulated the simple heart rate fog wave function. This is encouraging and sobering. Encouraging because it's amazing that, that they could do this, but also sobering that it's only a heart rate fog wave function, it's only 12 qubits. Having said so, just today, just today before connecting, there's, I saw a paper in the archive by uh, John Preskill and Jared McLean on proving an exponential advantage over quantum simulation. Uh, tasks related to uh, state discrimination, I think. I mean, I just saw the abstract, I downloaded it, okay? And this is how fast the field is moving. Like every day you have to look at the archive and see what's going on. And so I need to download that paper by Jarrod McLean. Now, it, it goes as, as, as fast that in this particular paper here that you see here, Zapata released a very, very, very large amount of work they did with British Petroleum. British Petroleum wanted to know how much you will need to simulate with variational ligand solver molecules that take care about. But full basis set limit, exact simulations, like pretty much extrapolated simulations to the full CI limit. And um, so Zapata developed the tool orchestra that now we sell for that, actually, uh, to run hundreds of thousands of calculations to benchmark this. And this is the number of days. Remember 71 I was telling you? Well, that doesn't matter. You can buy 71 uh, IonQ computers if you wanted to solve this problem. But uh, what matters here is the number of qubits, 260. Number of qubits equals 13 times the number of electrons for the phase basis set limits. But I told you you can get a factor between two and 10, right? Already, completely mixable with this. So we're working with Zapata, my group did this, Zapata did that, now we're working together to try to update this. And I bet you many of the young people in this room will update that even further. So the field, in the algorithm side, it's squeezing the lemon very fast. And in the hardware side, it's coming up really quickly. So I am bullish and optimistic that interesting things will happen, like the one that Gerald and John Presky just put today in the archive. And now, for the end of this talk, literally for the, for the cream on the pie, I'm going to tell you in the last three minutes what we've been thinking beyond the variation leg in solver for molecules. Remember I told you that in that book by Peter Gallison that all of us should read because it's a book about the history of computer simulation. In that book, Peter Gallison was saying, it's amazing that my computer simulated itself. And that's how I, I'm using this computer to type this book, right? So guess what we thought? We said, now these quantum computers are big enough that compete or outperform the classical simulators. That ultimately is behind this idea of quantum supremacy, okay? or quantum primacy, I think they changed the name to quantum primacy or something. Of course, much better name. Uh, so there's also Chinese supercomputers, like uh, there's, a, there's a superconducting one and a quantum optics one. 
that already have shown this. So I'm not going to get into the argument if, if they are at on par or a little bit above a supercomputer. They are almost there, or they are. So therefore, look at this paper. This is the this is uh, the number of transmons that have been reported as, as of the time of the grinding of this paper in different chips. This is the growth in supercomputers, how much they can simulate it. Remember the flat full CI line I told you about? That flat exact degradation line can be seen here as well. This is real data. All of this in my paper, all these plots are cited papers, okay? This is the gap that we're trying to exploit. A quantum computer cannot simulate itself anymore. And so, sorry, classical computers cannot simulate quantum computers anymore. So we said, okay, if we have all the tools that many groups, including mine, have developed for a long time for simulating fermions and simulating systems like that, what about the bosons in reality? The superconducting qubits are these bosons, like nonlinear harmonic oscillators, nonlinear oscillators, right? You can think about them like that. Turns out that if you expand them in a basis, and if the basis is the right basis, you can write the same type of variational and, and phase estimation algorithms for them. And then your question is going to be, what is the overhead? And the overhead is four qubits, 16 levels per qubit. So if you're going to simulate a transmog, we found that, and this is a paper with Will Oliver, so he knows what he's talking about in terms of the precision. If you're going to simulate a superconducting qubit with, an, with, a, super, with a quantum computer, you only require four logical qubits to simulate every qubit. In other words, the lesson from this is that a quantum computer can simulate a quarter of itself, at least superconducting, which tells you that as you design quantum computers with tens of thousands of qubits, you will use themselves to simulate their submodules, their T gate generator, their blah, blah, blah. So I believe this application of quantum computer aided design is going to be one of the next applications of quantum computing in the future. And on that, I'm going to skip a lot of slides. I do apologize. I thought this talk uh, was a little bit longer, but uh, here is a picture of my group pre coming back. And uh, we were just talking about uh, COVID in Toronto. Um, we're, we're well vaccinated. So we took our COVID tests and we went to review to, uh, to a retreat in the northern of Ontario. So I'm very happy to show you my group together again. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a landmark. Perhaps the most important slide of the, of the, of the talk. And with that, I'm going to open up for questions. Thank you. Thank you. OK, questions. You can actually ask questions directly to Alan. Yeah, a few um, people didn't ask anything in the chat. So feel free <laughs> to unmute yourself. And, and we, I try to make time so we have time to chat. So, I just want to see, nice to see your face. Yeah, okay. Somebody was asking something. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, David. Yeah, so, uh, so David. Uh, great talk, Alan. Great talk, Alan. Thank you very much. So all of what you described are variational and phase estimation methods, right? Um, th this is really where chemistry and quantum computing meet, right? Um, there are a lot of other problems, like nonlinear driven problems. Uh, can I do non-equilibrium, non-linear non driven problems like multidimensional spectroscopies and these sorts of things? Can, are, are there methods that are being developed to, to do those sorts of things? Because I don't think you can formulate those problems as variational. No, 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 but there are a lot of algorithms. I've, I've worked on many as well myself and many people in this room as well. Uh, I think um, Daniel Sabria and many others algorithms for doing quantum dynamics. So there are several approaches to it. Uh, we have a paper in 2008 where we proposed to use a grid that eventually was modernized a lot by, uh, by um, the Google group in, in collaboration with us as well. Uh, we have a grid-based method that is very, very useful for long-term based methods. So the way I will do it, David, is the way uh, Domke and Negorova and those guys simulated directly the pulses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, the way to simulate, at least the way I think you simulate a nonlinear spectroscopy experiment in a quantum computer would be uh, sending the, the time dependent Hamiltonian to it and then propagating in time. The reason I think we're not so concentrated on that is because uh, you will require many more qubits. So, uh, but if you ask me, do we have the technology and we know more or less how to do that? Uh, the answer would be yes. Uh, 
I think, is there a paper that says realizing nonlinear spectroscopy in a quantum computer yet? I don't think so. But who knows? The field is moving so fast that I wouldn't be surprised that, that somebody could write that paper really quickly and estimate realistically the, the, the cost associated with it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, then let me ask you a quick question. So do you think that there will be a time that quantum computation can actually replace the classical quantum chemistry, meaning that um, quantum computation can be actually used as practical tools for uh, calculating all the electronic structure? OK, I'm only knock on wood um, that I'm healthy enough. <laughs> Um, you know, you never know these days. When I'm 45, I was still in Sugi and feeling old nowadays. Uh, I, I like to say yes before before I, I go away, right? I'm pretty sure um, there will be in the next five days, five years, or two to three to five, who knows when exactly, there's going to be a quantum advantage um, application. What, what does Zapatas mean? My company has a definition that I like a lot, okay? And it's not because it's my company. It's the one that I think is the most realistic. Will a quantum computer enter any commercial workflow for any reason? It might be time, it might be speed, it might be convenience. It doesn't really matter, but if you have a quantum computing, quantum computer producing information for a commercial task anywhere in the world, that's what my company wants to do, right? And many others. Chemistry may not be the first application of this because chemistry requires more qubits and more gates than we need, right? Uh, than we need for other things. But it's, it's up there in one of the top three or four. So I think first we will see that, Sugi. Then a few years later, we'll see some chemistry ones. And today or yesterday too, by the way, did you guys see in the archive, there was a paper on the first fault tolerant demonstration of a, of a T-gate from Europe, okay? All of these things are happening in the last two or three days, okay? So what I'm trying to say is, uh, do you, if I'm asking myself, Will we need fault tolerance to get to that point, Sugi, or not? I don't think we will, but uh, so many people, skeptics, skeptical people like, oh, the Varen Plateau's problem. I keep telling people, when we get to having the Varen Plateau's problem, we'll have heuristics for it. Well, let's first see it. <laughs> let's first actually have a quantum computer that gets to the Varen Plateau, and then let's just we'll fight it, right? So I'm very practical in that sense, and I think we will be able to do something related to chemistry even before error correction. Because we're going to have this hybrid error corrected variational algorithm somewhere along the way in the next couple of years, um, come more and more useful. So I'm trying to catch my bet, Sugi, because you cannot predict the future. But everything yeah. I see yeah. as, an, as an insider in my company and the great number of qubits that have been uh, now, for example, IBM is predicting next year they're going to have a machine with 400 qubits. Well, how useful are they will be? It will have to do with how coherent they are. But they keep increasing the quantum volume, so I'm bullish on this. Uh, so we, yes, I think before you and I retire, before you and I retire, we'll do quantum chemistry. In a quantum. So, so what will be the major critical issue? Is it hardware issue or is it algorithm issue or both? And so, can you single out maybe two critical issues that have to be resolved? If they are resolved, that you will be really, yeah. really, real, really convinced. Sure. Uh, well. It's hard to convince you, Sugi, but we'll try. Uh, number <laughs> one, uh, number one, uh, yes, hardware. I mean, uh, this quantum volume, which again uh, simplified to an area, number of qubits times number of 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 gates that you can do on them, say, um, has to keep growing. That's what matters. That's why ion traps are an interesting technology because even though they they have right now less qubits, they are very precise, right? So. Yes, I think as the hardware progresses, the quantum chemist will squeeze it out like a lemon. For example, the 12 qubit Google experiment was what you could do maybe two years ago with their machines, right? They have new machines that are coming online. So let's see what happens with their new machines. Um, number two, in the algorithm side, I don't think so. In the algorithm side, I think we're much more advanced. Uh, I think there are these improvements I've been telling you on the basis on the number of measurements, on the optimization, that make me very bullish to say that the algorithms are pretty much ready for the hardware. Um, so I think the hardware is what we are mostly waiting for. 
Just quickly, thank you, Alan. Uh, Brenda, yeah, thank you. Uh, Brenda, can you ask a question first? Yeah. No, no, just like, thank you, Alan. I'm sorry, I missed the first few minutes. So sorry for that. Okay. It's okay. Uh, Brenda had a question, I think. Yeah, I was just going to quickly push you on the measurement issue, right? So, so if you want a highly accurate measurement, you 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 now have to continually measure, and that could essentially be exponential. Um, is is that a reasonable argument or no? Uh, you know, if you want highly accurate energies per se, right? You can measure something else and it's easier, but if you want an energy, what's the scale? No, 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 no. Uh, firstly, um, firstly, no, no. If you want to calculate an expectation value of a molecule, the energy of a molecule. Tons of work on statistics has been done. Uh, check out our review, it has a huge section on measurement. Uh, uh, that the way you wanna think about it, Brenda, is like Mon sampling, like Monte Carlo sampling. You wanna get an error bar down, you get more measurements, but it's not an exponential cost. It's a cost that actually, if you use some of the algorithms that Zapata has developed, actually is quadratically better than Monte Carlo say, okay? so. In terms of the scaling of the, of the with respect to the error, uh, so these are algorithms that are hybrids between phase estimation and direct measurement. Um, but even if you do direct measurement, the question is how many operators you need to specify the energy of a many body system? Can you group them using group theory? Can you measure them in order? Can you filter them? And that's the work of the beautiful work of. I was so lucky when I moved to Toronto, there was a guy, Arthur Ismailov there. Amazing, you, you guys know him. That was just moved into quantum computing. So Arthur- Okay, is, is, uh, Alan, is, yeah. Is by the way, I have back. to interrupt here because I know you yeah. have the capability to talk for more than one hour. <laughs> but anyway, so thank you again for really great uh, talk. And after the workshop has ended, uh, there will be also informal discussion. Uh, so please uh, join the informal discussion. And this became uh, now a nice uh, segue for our next speaker, uh, Brenda Rubenstein. So she is from uh, Brown University. Uh, Brenda, uh, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Sagi, for the introduction. Um, I'm really pleased to, to be here today, and particularly because when I was a graduate student in, in New York, I, I really appreciated these events where we can get a, a really quick sampling of the field and, and get out and, and meet people um, who are experts in different areas. So, so it's really nice to be a part of one of these on the other side of the coin. Um, I should also apologize. I'm coming off of a regular virus, not, not a scary virus, uh, and so hopefully my voice doesn't go out. So, so hopefully you can't virtually get it. It's not COVID, I, I, I promise. Um, so today I, I want to branch off of uh, Alon's discussion. Uh, he had a brilliant introduction um, where he talked about a few different quantum hardwares. Uh, and, and today I'm going to focus on, on some of my group's work to try to understand one specific hardware. Uh, and, and so this is an area uh, where quantum chemistry meets quantum computation that might be different than, than you think uh, and, and what people typically talk about. Uh, what we've been trying to do is use quantum chemistry to try to understand how to make some of these hardwares better. Uh, and in particular, we've been looking at ion traps. Um, so as Alan alluded to, uh, ion trap quantum computers are, are highly accurate. However, they do suffer from a, a decoherence problem that, that relates to what we call the, the anomalous noise problem. Uh, and so my group has been trying to understand what are the the chemical fundamentals, what are the things that, that cause that, that anomalous noise uh, in these quantum computers so that we can drive that noise down? Uh, so just to start out with, uh, what we're interested in are ion trap quantum computers. Uh, these are quantum computers that, that trap uh, different atomic ions. These could be uh, calcium-40, uh, th these could be ytterbium, there are a variety of different ions. Uh, and these ions are, are trapped usually in linear Paul traps. Um, by electromagnetic fields. Um, what's interesting about these, these ions uh, is that they, they consist of two level systems. Um, you can represent these two level systems in, in a couple of different ways. Uh, so these could be the, the ground and excited state, uh, electronic excited state of, of these ions, um, or they could be hyperfine states. Uh, and so, so typically in, in some of the uh, realizations I'll, I'll show you today, the, the, these are hyperfine states. Um, these hyperfine states are oftentimes coupled uh, to the motion of the ions in the trap. So you can, you can think of them uh, as interacting through Coulomb repulsions. They are ions. Uh, and so if you change uh, the, the states uh, of the different ions, then that's actually going to affect uh, the motional modes of, of the trap. So these are typically 
um, correlated with each other uh, and, and form a, a state for, for computation. Um, what's very nice about these ions is, is that we can fairly readily control transitions between uh, these internal states uh, ju just using lasers. Uh, and so you can think of these devices as being extremely controllable. Um, and, and in fact, as a result of, of their extreme control in some sense, uh, they, they have extremely high, in, in particular, single gate fidelities. Uh, I'm quoting 99.5%, but honestly, in many of these experiments, it's much, much higher than that for the single gates. Um, and they have reasonably good uh, two gate fidelity. So, so we're still talking about the 97% or 98% regime, depending upon which papers you talk about. Um, as uh, Alon alluded to, uh, so, so this is a really nice property if, they, if these gates have, different, have, have very high fidelities. Um, but uh, we, we are limited in the size of, of these different quantum computers right now. So uh, IonQ is one of the, the key companies that, that's investing in this technology right now. Um, and, and they have online an 11 qubit machine. Uh, however, they, they're projecting to, to release results on, on a 32 qubit machine uh, very soon as far as I know. Um, so we can trap a, a large number of such qubits. Uh, however, the, the demonstrations for quantum computation on them are still on a, a reasonably small number of qubits. Uh, so the, the event advantages here are, are the fidelity, but also the fact that these qubits are, in, in fact, highly entangled. Uh, so, so many people would argue that they're fully connected, which, which is also uh, a strong advantage. Now, the, the issue is, is that even though these fidelities are, are relatively high, um, they're still not necessarily perfect, right? We're not anywhere, we're, we're not at 100%, particularly for the, the two qubit gates that are important for computation. Um, and so one might want to ask, why is that? Uh, and, and the key reason for this is, is because uh, over time, uh, those motional modes, uh, will, the, the uh, emotional modes, emotional states will, will increase in, in number. So if you actually start the system uh, at, in, in your average state n here of, of let's say zero, um, over time, that average state numbers is going to increase uh, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, so, so we'll get to some of those reasons in a second. Uh, and, and so what you can see here is that as that n increases, so, so as uh, essentially your normal modes uh, are, are increasing, over time, um, that makes it very, very hard uh, to ensure that your quantum computations are, are correct. Uh, in, in particular, if you want to do error correction, um, people would oftentimes argue that the rate at which uh, the, this uh, n should be changing is about two, uh, 10 quanta per second. Uh, and what you can see in a recent experiment is, is that we're, we're oftentimes looking at a, a rate of change of something like 50 to 100 and, and maybe even several hundred quanta per second. Uh, so we wouldn't be able to do error correction on these kinds of systems unless we can actually uh, bring these states, uh, th this noise, this heating uh, down. Um, so the, the heating that causes this N to rise over time is something that people in the field have dubbed anomalous heating. Uh, the reason being is that for quite some time, people weren't sure where this was coming from uh, whatsoever. Uh, so the first guess that people had is, is that maybe this is something called Johnson noise. Uh, you can think about this as, as electronic motion uh, in the, the actual traps themselves uh, that would cause heating. Uh, the, this is this fairly uh, standard form of noise. Um, but if you look at the plot on the right, uh, that noise is it creates for a heating rate that's much, much lower than what's actually seen in the experiment. So on this plot, the, the dots are, of course, experimental results. Uh, and this gray band is, is that thermal heating. Uh, so we do, in fact, see heating that's significantly larger uh, than what we would expect from that simple Johnson noise explanation. And so therefore, people thought about this as being anomalous because they couldn't just say it, it was Johnson noise. Um, we're not totally clueless as to what this noise is. Uh, we do have uh, a number of measurements. So, so people have made ion traps of all different geometries, all different configurations, different types of ions over the years, and tried to measure uh, how the noise varies with those different geometry dependences and, and, and other dependences. Uh, so one thing that people will measure uh, is essentially the electric field fluctuation. Um, it turns out I'll show you some quick equations in a second that that electric field fluctuation um, is, is uh, can entirely explain uh, the noise. So, so this is a good proxy for measuring the noise. Uh, and if you plot that electric field fluctuation versus uh, the, the distance that the ion is from, from the surface of the trap, um, what you can see is that it follows a few scaling relationships. So uh, as you plot it as a function of distance, 
uh, the gray lines here uh, mark what would be one over d squared uh, dependence, uh, and the gray shaded regions, uh, so, so this white region in the middle marks what we would say is one over d to the fourth. And we see that many of these experiments tend to be in this one over d to the fourth regime, uh, again, higher than, than the one over d squared. What we also know, and, and I'll emphasize this in, in the talk to, to come, is that we do we do understand the frequency dependence of this noise as well. Uh, so if we look at omega, uh, what we find is that generally the frequency uh, has uh, an alpha here uh, of one. So we, we call this colloquially one over F noise overall. So, so there is some scatter in the experiments on the right, but you generally see that many of the experiments are falling in this, this one regime. What that means for us is that if we want to be able to explain what's going on in these different experiments, uh, we have to be able to reproduce that one over F scaling and, and these distance scaling. So I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, another hint as to what is going on in these different systems is what happens if you clean the surface traps? Uh, and, and so, you know, maybe this doesn't sound shocking to you, uh, but, you know, the, the, there is crud that gets attached to these tra traps over time if they're exposed to open air. Uh, and so as a result of that, lots of different species are, are, are attached to these traps. Um, and it's in what people have thought about, as, as we, again, we'll discuss in a second, is that it's the jiggling motion uh, of many of these absorbates that might cause this noise. So evidence for this, uh, as you can see on the left, uh, is that uh, if you look at these traps and you do Auger spectroscopy on them, what you'll see is that there's typically a few monolayers of, of different types of hydrocarbons uh, on top of the surfaces of these traps. Um, and when you clean the trap, so, so one form of possible cleaning is what's called ion bombardment. So you can take AR plus, uh, you, you can uh, basically direct it at the surfaces of the traps and then you can clean them. Uh, if you do that, then you no longer see these hydrocarbons. But what you also importantly see is that the noise goes down. Uh, so on the right hand side, I show two different situations. Uh, I show one situation where the traps are not cleaned, uh, and then I show one situation uh, where the traps are cleaned. Uh, and what you see is that essentially the noise is going down by two orders of magnitude when you perform that cleaning. Uh, and so the suggestion would be that it has something to do with those carbons that we see in the OJ spectroscopy before we clean. Um, but exactly what is going on is, is the key question here. So, so what species are we talking about? How are they producing these, this noise? How is it coupling uh, with these, these different fields to, to produce the noise over time? Uh, so what my group wanted to go in and, and answer is really microscopically what is happening here uh, so that we can create some engineering advances uh, so that we can reduce this noise overall. Uh, so uh, what I should say is that the, the person who did most of the work on this uh, is, is Ben Foulon. Uh, actually, now he's a, a fifth year chemie. Uh, wow, well, it's been a long time uh, in, in my group. Uh, this picture of Ben when he was at, at Princeton, uh, let's just say at Brown, he doesn't quite look like this anymore, but the, this is Ben. Uh, and then we, we also did this in consultation uh, with a couple of researchers at, at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory um, who, who helped us think a lot about these, these different types of experiments. Um, so what Ben and I thought about doing to, to try to illuminate what's going on in, in these traps uh, is we started with something called a patch potential model. So floating around the literature for, for quite some time, uh, and this is the, the general surface literature, so, so people who, who have thought about surfaces for, for a long time, way longer than me, are, are well aware of these models. Um, we started with a patch potential model, which basically assumes that the noise that can come from the surface has to do uh, with fluctuations in, in dipoles that are caused by uh, a variety of different phenomena that could go on at the surface. Uh, so you could get fluctuations in, in dipoles as a result of absorbates moving around, uh, moving up and down, or uh, otherwise uh, across the surface. But you can also get fluctuations in dipoles uh, as a result of having different boundaries uh, on the surface. And, and so then you get sort of a discontinuity in the potential. Uh, so whenever you have fluctuations in the potential coming from a surface, people call that a patch potential model. Um, but you know, for, for this situation and for a variety of other situations, uh, it wasn't really clear, you know, what, what is actually causing these different types of fluctuations. So one can do some quick math on this uh, and, and one can work out exponents uh, if you assume different species underlying this patch potential model. Uh, so if you assume dipole fluctuations, that, that maybe there, there's an atom, an absorbate that's moving up and down vertically, singularly, you could work out that the exponents that I just discussed before are pretty close to experiment. So one of the first things that we went in and did, and I'll you know, be a shocker, the first thing that we did was actually 
incorrect uh, was, was that we assume that this is coming from single absorbate or single atom fluctuations. Uh, and, and so what we did to try to trace that down uh, is, is we modeled simple absorbates. Uh, so things like benzene on, on gold traps. So, so oftentimes these Paul traps are, are made out of metals like gold. Uh, and we, what you can do is you can calculate the dipole-dipole fluctuation uh, function, uh, and you can relate that to the noise through this uh, electric field, electric field uh, correlation function. Uh, and once you do that, then, then you can get a reasonable estimate for the noise that's produced. Uh, and so what we did in order to do this is, is that we uh, modeled using density functional theory, these different surfaces. We calculated the potentials uh, above these surfaces. And then we also calculated the dipole moments that different molecules would have at different heights above these surfaces. Uh, and then we fed these essentially into a kinetic model uh, that, that would allow the, the hydrocarbons uh, and the other absorbates that we use uh, to, to move between the different vibrational states uh, of of the, the, the bound potentials. Uh, and the reason why we're doing that is, is some of the original models suggested that it really is a single absorbate moving in its vibrational levels that could cause this noise. So we did that, and, and there were a few things that were correct. Uh, so when we plot these, these heating rates as, as a function of, of frequency, um, what we find is, in fact, that hydrocarbons, so C2H2, for example, or C6H6, um, these hydrocarbons do, in fact, produce the most electric field noise. So that's good, uh, that that works out. Uh, there are species that of course bind much more strongly to the surface than, than these hydrocarbons, uh, but for things that bind very, very strongly, they actually can't produce that much noise, right? If you think about it, if you're bound very strongly, how much, how, how much could your dipole fluctuations truly be? Uh, and so that worked out. Uh, but if you look at this plot closely, uh, what you observe are a couple of things. Number one, uh, our x-axis is in terms of megahertz. Uh, many of these traps function in the in uh, the megahertz regime, but if you look at the scale here, we're talking like 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 megahertz for, for this kind of fluctuation. That's way too high, much, much higher than the 0.1 to, let's say, 10 megahertz regime that these traps typically work in. Um, so these results suggest that, yes, this is a mechanism for noise, but the frequency regime for this noise is, is far, far too high. Um, what you also observe here is that we're not getting that one over F. Uh, so what I mentioned is that that alpha exponent on the frequency is usually one. Uh, here we were mostly seeing that we either get white noise, so this curve is flat at the top, um, or it goes very, very quickly to, to one over F squared. Uh, and so that doesn't really match experiment. Right? We're not in the right frequency regime and we're not seeing the right shapes. Uh, and so even though many people have espoused this kind of model for, for quite some time, show that, that that's just not the right intuition as far as we're concerned. So what really is causing these much lower frequency megahertz regime uh, types of noises? What's going on here? So, so we've thought about it for a while. Uh, and, and then we, we thought about, you know, what's really going to pull that frequency range down? So what could pull that frequency range down is interactions among many, many different absorbates. So what we thought about is, why don't we actually combine situations B and C here? Um, why don't we actually create a monolayer of absorbates um, that are interacting with each other, and therefore, if they interact collectively, could create low-frequency collective motions that might be able to, to create exactly the noise with these kinds of features. Um, and so we, we went forth and, and, and did that. We, we calculated our dipole-dipole uh, correlation functions and Fourier transformed them and then did them for a variety of different uh, uh, absorbate species. Uh, so, so again, we work with very simple hydrocarbon absorbates for now to, to prove the point. So we're mostly putting methane on these gold surfaces. Um, and we did so at, in the submonolayer regime and then the supermonolayer regime uh, and then observed the kind of noise that we get. So, so what's interesting here, uh, and this is really the first demonstration of this, is that if you do put uh, correlated you know, interacting absorbates together down uh, as either monolayers or supermonolayers, that you do in fact get that one over F regime. So what you can see in the plots here, particularly the plot on the right, uh, is that we're, we're very close, these, these spectra uh, are very close to having one over F uh, through uh, very close to the, the megahertz regime, right? So before we were talking about being in the regime of 10 to the four megahertz, right now we're in literally the megahertz regime. Uh, and so that notion that it, it should be collective motion seems to be correct here. Um, now, there are a couple of things that are, are going on here. Uh, so at very high frequencies, we see that at higher temperature, we get more noise. And, and so that's what you would sort of intuitively expect. 
what I'll tell you is that at these high frequency regimes, these high frequency regimes uh, are, are this high frequency noise is being created by single absorbates moving around on that surface. Um, it's really these low frequency regimes that are created by collective motion. So again, people previously had this picture that if, if it is species running across the surface, that it's single species. But single species is again, too high frequency in, in noise. It's really the collective motions that's bringing us down in, in frequency. Um, the other thing that I'll pick out here is that if you see this, this one over F uh, and, and you're looking at these, these higher noise regimes, you see it's actually at lower temperatures, the noise is higher for this one over F. So I see this blue curve, which corresponds to 25 K on the top and actually the higher temperature curves tend to be uh, lower in noise. And so for a long time, honestly, it was, it was maybe about a year, you know, Ben and I were, were sort of at a standstill and working on other things because we said, how could this be? Uh, you know, it doesn't, doesn't make sense that at, at lower temperatures, you should have more noise. Um, but, you know, Ben and I kept pushing, you know, I kept saying, Ben, can we find a mechanism? Can we find a mechanism? Um, and, and Ben did find a mechanism. Uh, so Ben was able to show that, in fact, these collective motions, uh, the collective motions that lead to a higher noise at low temperatures um, come from very, very rare events that are more frequent at lower temperatures. So, so these are a few examples of, of these kinds of events. So you'll get a, a bunch of rotations of all the molecules on the surface, axis realignment, whole island translational shifts of patches of particles. Um, these are all possibilities for, for creating that low frequency collective noise. Uh, and if you go to high temperatures, at high temperatures, this collective motion uh, is basically destroyed, right? So at high temperatures, each particle starts to want to do more of its own thing. And so that, that destroys this. And so we can directly show uh, that, that actually this is what's causing what's, what's going on. So that was at submonolayer. Uh, you might say, oh, you know, well, why would you have a, a submonolayer coverage on many of these different surfaces? Well, of course, you can have supermonolayer coverages. So, so these are a few examples. Uh, and, and what you see is that we also get one over F uh, in, in many of these cases. Uh, so uh, at high coverages, it sort of dissipates, but, but uh, in moderate coverages, and, and this also works for more monolayers, uh, you do get one over F here. Uh, and the reason for this is a little bit different than before. It's again, collective motions, but what we were able to see is that in this case, um, a lot of the motions were accounted for by molecules moving across different layers. So they're actually exchanging layers. So what I show here is the trajectory of a few different particles. You know, one particle, this green particle is actually switching layers. Um, and when it switches layers, its dipole changes dramatically. So we can actually show that that produces exactly this one over F uh, kind of frequency spectrum. Um, and you can fit this uh, to what we call uh, a two-level fluctuator model, and it actually perfectly fits that model in this case. Um, we suspect that you can also fit some of the submonolayer noise to, to similar fluctuator models, but it's a little bit more tricky because what is a state and what's not when things are moving across the surface collectively. So that said, um, what we've been able to do is, is we've been able to, to use quantum chemistry to try to explore the source of noise in, in one type of, of quantum computer. Uh, and the hope is that understanding this, this, the origin of this noise would actually allow people to engineer um, higher fidelity machines in, in, in the future. Um, what we were able to show in particular for the first time is that we can actually recover uh, 1 over F noise, which is what people experimentally see in the right frequency regimes with the right distance scalings and many of the right temperature scaling. So I didn't go into the temperature story here. Um, but that was at least reassuring that we can mi atomistically, microscopically tell people where this noise is coming from and maybe what they should be careful about in terms of substrates and in terms of absorbates that they're using uh, that, that could also get in their system. Um, we are missing things. Things, right, where we haven't talked about vibrations, we haven't talked about different mixtures of molecules. There's really no control over, I shouldn't say no control, but there, there's less control over what's getting on the surface, um, no quantum effects, nothing like that. So, so there are subtleties to our model, but we think this at least points in the right direction towards uh, you know, what is truly causing the noise in these different machines. Um, so there are many things to understand from the quantum chemistry perspective that we can still provide advice to, uh, and I think that that applies beyond ion traps to many other different quantum architectures. Uh, and, and I hope you, you see that there are still issues you know, with the hardware that we can continue to, to discuss later. Um, so with that, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge my group. Uh, you know, my group always looks, makes me look better than I am. Uh, so this is my group. Uh, you know, we had to 
take this outside in the night, but uh, you know, this is Providence night. Uh, so I'm very thankful to my group and my collaborators at, at Livermore uh, for, for working on, the, uh, on this project with us. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Okay, questions? Okay, okay Alan. Yeah. Okay, I promise to you it's going to be short, so give it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, this is very interesting, and, and it is, it's very nice to understand that these fluctuations in the potential for an ion trap. In the case of, of a superconducting machine, you, I can imagine we have similar surface effects. Yep. Mm -hmm. Have you inter have you been interested in entering that regime with a lot of mysteries? Yeah, yeah. So, so I haven't done work there myself on that, but you're, you're absolutely right. So, so people have seen similar absorption, for example, on on, on aluminum uh, of, of oxygenated species that could cause very, very similar noise. Um, and, and so, a lot of this also goes to those, um, although the materials involved are a little bit different. Uh, so, so yes, the the, the same kinds of things uh, should should correspond there as well. Mm -hmm. Ignacio, do you have a uh, question? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, fascinating. I, I was just wondering, can you comment on whether this noise behaves uh, fermionically or bosonically? And um, the other thing is whether um, the noise is sufficiently discriminatory to, to discern between different mechanisms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so we just use classical statistics here. So, so there were no quantum statistics involved so far. Uh, in, in doing any of this, uh, so so completely classical. Um, you know, the the quantum statistics I'd like to say probably don't matter sig significantly here because the species are are quite large. Um, but that that's something that we should probably think about further. Um, in in terms of uh, can you discriminate between the different noise sources? Uh, so what we what we can definitely see from experiments are, are magnitudes of of noise uh, and. You know, there, there are whole issues with geometry. So what I'll tell you is that experimentally, um, there could be more methodical protocols that would allow us to get at exactly what you're talking about. So, so let's say we wanted to compare hydrocarbon noise, hydrocarbons of X weight to hydrocarbons of Y weight. Um, we could do that, but the experiments have to sort of be directed in in that direction. Um, a lot of the experiments you use completely different traps and then completely different ions. So, so you're getting fluctuations from that, but it could absolutely be done. Uh, it, it's just, there has to be a program to do that. Okay, so we have three questions. Please, each of you keep questions short and also answers short. Uh, first, David Coco, next, Dayu Lu, and finally, Daniel Lida. Okay, David, go first. Brenda, great talk, thank you. Um, uh, just a quick question about the experiments. That slide had a very, very broad distribution yeah. of alpha, right? Yes. Uh, there was a seven in there, which was, um, I, yep. if I remember correctly, that yeah. was, what is going on in these different experiments? Yeah, so it's exactly what I was alluding to before. So there are people doing experiments. So, so that plot was, was really an accumulation of all the different experiments people have done. People are doing it in different traps with different ions, uh, you know, different setups, different, different surfaces. Uh, and so that's what I mean, that there has to be sort of a consistent program. Um, so a lot of people dismiss some of these outlier points. It's possible there's science there. Uh, and they dismiss it for what the trap geometries are. Uh, but if we had a consistent set of experiments, uh, there's some groups that are trying to do this, then, then we can eliminate whether that's true or not. Uh, but you're absolutely right. There, there is a big spread there right now. Thanks. Okay, Dayu. Hi, this is a great talk. I just have a question regarding the, uh, the, the, the absorbate uh, structure. So is there any experimental evidence that to verify there are kind of sub modulator absorbate like close to 0.5 from like STM or something else? Yeah, yeah. So, so there's a group at NIST uh, who, who has uh, a variety of techniques up where they're, they're actually trying to get this kind of information. So I showed you some of the OJ spectroscopy. Um, there are other groups that, that are working on this now to try to characterize. Um, they can tell you vaguely what species are on there, but you know, what mixtures exactly, which, which hydrocarbons. Um, a lot of that hasn't fully been published, but the, the NIST group is definitely working on that. Thank you. Okay, Daniel. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, hi, Brenda. Very nice. Uh, so uh, actually two related questions. Um, how would this noise scale as you uh, increase the size of, of the trap, the number of qubits? And does this give you any new insights into how to do error correction for these systems? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't think it should scale with the number of qubits. Uh, so, you know, basically these qubits are, are seeing a very wide field of the noise from the surface. Uh, so it's larger than their individual ex extent. Um, so I, I don't believe it scales that way. Uh, it does scale with the charge and so forth. Um, in terms of, of error correction, um, I'm, I'm not sure that it tells you about error correction. It, it just tells you how you can make surface materials better so that now your error, error rates are smaller. Uh, and therefore, you could do different types of error correction that you wouldn't be able to do before. That's the way I view it. Daniel, you have to unmute if you have more to, to say. Uh, no, uh, thanks. That's good. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank, Brenda, you. thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think uh, this is actually perfect timing. Now let me introduce Ignacio Franco from U University of Rochester. So he will be the host for the second uh, part of this workshop. Uh, Ignacio. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Daniel, it's my pleasure to introduce you. You taught me quantum mechanics uh, 10 years ago or more. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's great to have you here. So yeah, please, please go ahead. Great, well, thank you. All right, well, thanks Sugi for uh, uh, organizing this really interesting workshop. Um, I uh, am going to be the least chemical of, of all the speakers here. In fact, there will be uh, no mention of, of chemistry in my talk, but um, some of the things I'll, I'll, I'll talk about are certainly related to problems in uh, protein folding or lattices and so on of which I should say Alan was the, uh, the pioneer um, in the context of uh, quantum annealing. Um, and uh, what I'll say has to do with uh, uh, how to solve optimization problems more generally on, on quantum computers, and in particular in the context of using quantum annealing and D-Wave. So uh, let me start by uh, presenting you uh, with a, a series of, of cartoon slides that are related to the, the topic of, of this talk, which is on what I call algorithmic break-even. Uh, but first, um, let's talk just about uh, plain algorithmic scaling speed up, which is the, the thing we're going for in quantum computing. And so suppose that you, you have an algorithm uh, like a quantum chemistry there, I, I said it again, um, uh, type simulation uh, that would give an exponential speed up if everything goes well uh, on uh, running on quantum hardware. Uh, by everything goes well, I mean, uh, ideally we, we would have uh, a perfect quantum computer with no decoherence. And in that case, if you were to plot something like the time to solution, let's say, let's say time to chemical accuracy as a function of problem size, a quantum algorithm would uh, solve this problem in polynomial time. And the best classical algorithm you could come up with uh, would still require exponential time. So there would be this, this huge gap, which would be uh, visible uh, already for very small problem sizes, let's say the number of orbitals. Now, uh, the problem is, of course, that uh, this kind of thing has never been observed so far uh, on quantum hardware. And, uh, and the reason is that uh, there's decoherence. So when we have a noisy quantum computer uh, with decoherence, um, if there's only a little bit of decoherence, then Perhaps what happens is that the quantum polynomial becomes a polynomial with a higher degree. Uh, and so if, if that were the case, uh, then at least we would expect to see an advantage uh, for sufficiently large problem sizes. But again, we haven't seen that yet. Uh, so perhaps what's going on is that we're here. We're just looking at problem sizes that are too small because our quantum computers currently uh, only have a, a handful of qubits. Um, but actually things are a little worse uh, because we have, uh, rather noisy machines nowadays. And so it might be that uh, the polynomial has a very high degree in, in the quantum case, and then it just becomes really hard to distinguish it from a, um, an exponential scaling of, of the classical algorithm. Uh, so it could be that, that this is what's going on. Um, and that's probably closer to what has been observed nowadays on, on quantum hardware. But um, actually it looks like the, the scenario we're really in is this one, where there's just too much decoherence in the, the current uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum uh, era, era. Uh, and the uh, quantum uh, type of, of scaling that we observe in our systems is, is more like this, uh, this purple line here where uh, quantum and classical uh, both scale exponentially uh, and there's just uh, too much noise. And this, this kind of thing has definitely been observed. Um, uh, examples where uh, we can simulate um, using quantum computers, but uh, we don't observe an advantage yet. 
Now, if you think this is the, the worst that can happen, actually it isn't, it could even get worse than that. You could even have a phenomenon I'll call quantum blow up where uh, the, the problem becomes so noisy uh, that beyond a certain problem size, uh, your quantum computer just never returns the right answer. Uh, the probability of getting the right answer goes to zero. And so the time to solution um, essentially goes to infinity. And I'll, I'll actually show you some examples of this a little later in the talk. Okay, so um, <clears throat> with this in mind, uh, let's take a look at what, what has happened with, uh, with D-Wave, um, which uh, still has uh, by far, by an order of magnitude or more, the largest number of, of qubits uh, out there in the quantum hardware world. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you about a study that I was involved in where we were trying to um, solve optimization problems uh, on D-Wave using the previous generation of their quantum computers, uh, the, the so-called 2000Q machine, which had uh, 2048 qubits. And the problem we were trying to solve was uh, that of uh, finding the ground state of an, an Ising spin glass. Um, and the exact description of the spin glass uh, uh, won't matter right now. Uh, I just want to focus on, on the results we found. Uh, suffice it to say that these are hard problems. You can definitely not solve them in your head. At least I can't. Um, and the uh, results we got for D-Wave, uh, in some sense, were very encouraging here. So here is a, a plot of the time to solution on a log scale as a function of uh, the square root of the, the number of qubits. And the square root is there for a technical reason. Uh, and what you're seeing is the, the blue data are the results from solving these hard uh, spin glass problems on D-Wave uh, with up to 2,048 spins compared to one of the, the leading uh, generic classical algorithms simulated annealing. And as, as should be clear uh, by inspection of these curves, there is an advantage uh, both in terms of an absolute uh, uh, time but much more importantly, in terms of the scaling of these two curves, um, if you uh, uh, do a regression and, and find the uh, exponent uh, that is the best fit to, to these curves, you find that uh, the exponent B here and the, and the exponential uh, is statistically significantly smaller for D-Wave 0.76 versus almost exactly one for simulated annealing for, for these problems. Um, and that uh, is the first example of an experimental limited quantum scaling speed up limited because uh, the advantage that is shown here is, is true when you compare D-Wave to uh, simulated annealing. Now, the problem is that in order to demonstrate a, a genuine quantum speed up, you have to show an advantage over all uh, possible classical algorithms. Of course, there are infinitely many such algorithms. So you have to uh, try to pick the, the good ones. And it turns out there are at least two other algorithms, classical algorithms that beat D-Wave and that are better than simulated annealing for this problem. And so for example, this the purple line here, uh, the classical spin vector Monte Carlo algorithm is actually kind of a classical model of, of D-Wave if you were to assume that there's no entanglement uh, among the, the D-Wave qubits. Uh, but the best of these uh, is uh, simulated quantum annealing. Uh, which is uh, somewhat a uh, confusing uh, name, but it is just a classical quantum Monte Carlo algorithm uh, that is tailored to simulating uh, quantum annealing type uh, experiments. And you see that its coefficient, its, its slope is, is 0.37, which is um, even less than, uh, than half of, of the D-wave slope. Uh, so uh, this is the kind of uh, current state of the art that we have with uh, um, solving optimization problems, uh, really hard optimization problems, but nevertheless, uh, the, the, the quantum advantage um, is, is tenuous. And one might ask uh, why that happens. And of course, the answer is decoherence, uh, the, the, the good old enemy of quantum computing. And of course, there's also um, a well-known fix for that, and that is error correction. So let's go back to the, the cartoon version. And so suppose that we now introduce quantum error correction uh, to our decoherent quantum computer. And if you, uh, if you do that, then the uncorrected quantum uh, bad scaling, the purple scaling here would go down, presumably if everything went well to a, a back to a polynomial uh, type of, of scaling, which would beat the classical for sufficiently large problem sizes. Um, so I would define that as algorithmic success with quantum error correction. Right, so what is algorithmic success with quantum error correction? It's, it's when you observe that the corrected quantum scaling 
is better than both the uncorrected quantum, of course, but also the classical scale. This is the, the holy grail. Um, this is what uh, many, many groups around the world are, are, uh, are trying to achieve by developing better and better logical qubits. And Alon mentioned the fault and T-gate and so on. Um, so this is what we'd all like to do, but it's very, very hard. And so there is a, a more modest goal, which is the, uh, the focus of uh, what I wanna convey today. And uh, I think it's a really um, useful goal to have in mind uh, in this uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum era that we're in. And this is what I'd like to call algorithmic break even with quantum error correction. And, and by break even, what I mean is that the um, <clears throat> corrective quantum scaling, which is now this uh, brownish line here, is better than the uncorrected quantum scaling. But let's not set the bar too high yet. Uh, and let's not ask that we are going to beat uh, the best possible classical. All right, so, so algorithmic break even, I'd like to define as follows. Algorithmic break even with quantum error correction is when the corrected quantum scaling is better than the uncorrected quantum scaling, but not necessarily better than, than classical, All right? And then the question is whether this can be achieved with existing quantum hardware. So um, to explain uh, where we are in that regard, I want to uh, take a minute to talk about uh, uh, the D-Wave processors because this is uh, the work that we did in this context. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with them, what they are uh, is they are programmable quantum annealers. They're designed to solve primarily, but not exclusively optimization problems. Uh, and they're always formulated as, as Ising spin glass type Hamiltonians. So here's an Ising spin glass Hamiltonian. You have a local field term, you have a, um, an interaction term, you can program the H's, you can program the J's. And the problem is for a given set of H's and J's to find the minimizing spin configuration, the, uh, the spin configuration that minimizes the energy given the H's and the J's. And this is done in quantum annealing or in adiabatic quantum computing, ideally, uh, if you had a completely noiseless machine as follows, you, what you do is you introduce an additional transverse field the sum over the poly sigma x's here. Uh, and you initialize the machine in the ground state of this transverse term. So think of A as being large initially and B is, B is zero. And then you decrease A slowly and you increase B slowly at the same time. And so the ground state that was uh, the ground state of, of the transverse field, which is just the uniform superposition state, uh, slowly evolves by the adiabatic theorem into the ground state of, of the Ising Hamiltonian, which is the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, and so D-Wave built machines that were designed to implement this principle, this interpolation between a transverse and an, an Ising term, uh, starting uh, back in uh, now 10 years ago, uh, in October 2011, uh, they uh, uh, released the D-Wave 1, which was the, the first commercial quantum computer, uh, which uh, we uh, were fortunate enough to, to have uh, at USC. Uh, that had 128 qubits. And then uh, roughly every two years or so, they uh, quadrupled the number of qubits going through a number of generations. Uh, the experiments I'll, I'll tell you about were all, all done on, on the D-Wave 2000Q device. Um, and currently there is actually a 5,640 uh, qubit uh, device known as the D-Wave Advantage. Uh, so <clears throat> what are the, uh, the D-Wave machines in a bit more detail? Uh, they use superconducting niobium uh, flux qubits. Uh, on the previous generation devices, they were all uh, on the so-called chimera graph architecture. Uh, the red circles are the qubits, uh, the, the black lines are the, the connections, the couplings between the qubits. Um, and the, the largest of these chimera-based machines was the 2000Q, which, which had uh, 2,048 qubits uh, when they were all functional. You see that here there are some empty circles, so sometimes not all the qubits yielded. That's, that's rather common in, um, in, in quantum computing. Um, in any case, there were machines that were fully yielded as well. They were arranged in, in this uh, chimera graph um, where you have uh, unit cells of, of eight qubits, and uh, you had, uh, they were arranged, the unit cells were arranged in a square grid of, uh, of up to 16 such uh, uh, unit cells per side. Uh, so the total number of qubits uh, is eight L squared where L is the number of unit cells per side. Let's uh, keep that L in mind because it will 
uh, come up later. So L again is just the number of unit cells per side. Um, I should say that in the, uh, the new Advantage machine, uh, the connectivity is very different and, uh, and higher. Uh, every qubit is coupled to up to 15 qubits. Uh, but I, I don't have any uh, results to share with you about that today. So um, when people criticize D-Wave, and as, as I'm sure, um, I'm sure that, that this, this is something you've heard about, uh, you know, the D-Wave machines are noisy and so on. So what's that about? It's, it's really about the following two things. Uh, the T1 and T2 times, the, the relaxation and dephasing times uh, have been measured and uh, they're on the order of, of uh, a few nanoseconds, let's say 10 nanoseconds. But the annealing time, the time it takes to, to complete one run uh, is at least one microsecond on these machines. So that's, that's not a great ratio. And uh, you might suspect that uh, the qubits will decohere before the computation is complete. And to some extent, uh, that critique is, is valid. Uh, <clears throat> the second point is that the, the minimum gap of the Hamiltonian, remember you're trying to stay in the ground state. So any thermal excitation out of the ground state to an excited state uh, can be detrimental. And that minimum gap uh, that determines whether there will be an excitation or not, can be much smaller than the temperature, the, the dilution refrigerator temperature, which is, which is about 10 millikelvin. And that means that thermal excitations can kick you out of the ground states uh, rather easily, especially as you go, as you try to solve a, a hard problem that has a small gap. Uh, so I view these machines primarily as, as a test bed for algorithmic scaling with noisy qubits and error correction. And I think that's an appropriate perspective for all uh, NISC era uh, quantum computers. I, I guess I'm a little less bullish than Alan about this. Uh, I think that uh, um, <clears throat> what we can do with our current devices is, is likely to be uh, testing uh, algorithms uh, and, and, and how we can improve their performance uh, by introducing various error correction tricks. Uh, I, don't, I don't expect to see major breakthroughs in the NISC era uh, in a practical sense. Uh, I think error correction is, is going to be very, very important. And if there's anything you take away from this talk, is it, it should be that, that uh, we're not going to get very far without error correction, at least in my opinion. Okay, so now back to algorithmic breakeven. And uh, I want to tell you about first about results that uh, we, we achieved already, uh, what is it now, six or seven years ago. Uh, these are Ising spin glass uh, type problems. Uh, so uh, here's the Hamiltonian, no H's, just J's. And the J's are chosen at random from, uh, from this distribution. Uh, a thousand spin glass instances, that, that means a thousand choices of, uh, of, of, of J's uh, like this uh, for each size, problem size N. And those were run on the machine we had at the time, the D-Wave 2 that had only 503 functional qubits out of 512. And first results without error correction. So here you see the, the time to solution as a function of the number of physical qubits. Um, and you see a number of curves which represent different percentiles. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the yellowish curve here is the median. Uh, so these were the problems that were median hard and then the hardest problems were the 95th percentile, the easiest problems were the 25th percentile and, and so on. And you see a scaling that is roughly exponential. Uh, and then we did error correction. I haven't told you how yet, but I will. And with error correction, uh, we see this the first example of algorithmic break-even in the sense that the error-corrected curves, no matter what percentile you look at, the error-corrected curves all have a better scaling than the un-error-corrected curves. Right? So this is precisely what I mean by algorithmic break-even. You do error correction and you get an improvement over not doing error correction. Um, and I'm not even uh, plotting the, the classical algorithms here because they are uh, even simulated annealing in this case was, was better than, uh, than D-Wave itself. Um, but nevertheless, the, the effect of error correction here is as desired. It reduces the scaling and reduces the absolute time as, as well. Uh, so what is this error correction technique that we, we call quantum annealing correction? Uh, let me try to explain it very briefly now. So error correction for quantum annealing is, is very different than error correction uh, for circuit model, gate model type quantum computers, because we're much more limited in, in the programmability of these devices. Uh, and so what, what we did um, in this case, the so-called quantum annealing correction method is uh, the following. The first step is to encode the, the Hamiltonian into a repetition code. And this means that every logical qubit, a bar now represents a logical qubit, a logical qubit is actually represented by um, 
a number of physical qubits, in this case, three physical qubits. Uh, and so if, if you have a, a logical or an encoded qubit on the left and another one on the right, you want to couple them. And the coupling is simply done pairwise like this. So the sigma i is a uh, sigma j bar term is just a pairwise coupling. That represents a logical coupling between encoded qubits. And then the next thing you do um, after this encoding into repetition code is you add a penalty term for flipping. Uh, bit flips are a type of error that we can prevent uh, or not, or, or at least suppress. And the way we do it is we take advantage of this chimera architecture and we take the fourth uh, qubit over here, color it red, and connect it ferromagnetically. The green, li green lines represent ferromagnetic couplings um, to its data qubits over here. And likewise with the, the blue connected to this blue penalty qubit. And the ferromagnetic coupling its role is to keep the data qubits aligned. Uh, and so they, they're less prone to flipping. In order to flip, they all have to flip together because they're, uh, they're connected to this penalty qubit. So there's a ferromagnetic penalty term here. And together, the uh, encoding um, and, the, um, uh, and the penalty term, um, we put those two encoded Hamiltonian and the penalty Hamiltonian together, and we can adjust their scale. Um, and then we can um, uh, run the encoded plus energy penalized uh, annealing uh, process. Uh, and then the, the, the role of the, uh, the encoding here is that it allows us to do a majority vote. So for every group of three, we pick the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the answer that is the majority answer. Uh, over three. So if, if two are pointing up and one's pointing down, we'll, then we'll say that, that the answer is up. Um, so how does this work? It, it works as has been uh, uh, studied in these papers, uh, essentially by doing two things. We introduce an energy penalty against excitations and uh, we do this majority voting. Um, and we can show that that has three primary effects. It reduces the effective noise strength by a factor of, of root n, where n is the number of physical qubits per logical qubit. We can show that it reduces tunneling barriers. And we can show that this uh, procedure lowers the effective temperature. Um, OK, so let's see. Uh, I see there's something in the chat here. Uh, OK, so is telling me it's time to wrap up. All right. Well. Um, so uh, let me try to, uh, let me take another five minutes so again, and we'll leave five minutes for questions because uh, uh, there's a bit more material I want to get through here. So, so let's, um, let's now make it harder than what happened in, uh, in, in 2014, 2015. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the, the Ising Hamiltonian, and now we're going to add noise deliberately. We're going to add noise to the, uh, to the H's and the J's. Um, so there is already noise on the H's and the J's, and this is, this is uh, something that gives rise to what's called uh, J chaos. Um, so in fact, what you have is you don't have your ideal Hamiltonian that you programmed. Uh, there is some um, extra noise. Uh, let's focus on the J's. So there's some extra noise that, that's Gaussian distributed. It's called a delta J. Um, and the, that noise has been characterized, um, and it, it is intrinsically uh, it's Gaussian distributed with zero mean and a variance of about uh, 3% relative to the maximum value. So what we're going to do is we're going to make these problems much harder by not just taking the intrinsic noise, we're going to add even more noise uh, by hand. Um, we'll add 3%, 5%, and so on up to 15% extra noise. Okay, and then if, if you do that, if you add noise and you look at a similar type of optimization problem, you see here the time to solution again on a log scale as a function of the number of unit cells per side. Um, adding more noise, obviously, as you'd expect, makes the scaling significantly worse, all the way from uh, adding no noise, just the intrinsic noise of 3%, all the way to adding 15% noise, the scaling becomes very bad. And in fact, here's this phenomenon of quantum blow up that I was talking about earlier. Um, when, when we add 15% noise, the machine never finds the, the right ground state for problem sizes above L equals nine. However, when we do error correction, uh, now for these much harder problems, harder because they're so noisy, 
we once again see this very desirable effect of reducing the scaling and even extending the uh, range over which we can solve the problems up to the blow up point, right? So whereas for 15% noise earlier, we were limited to L equals nine, uh, now we can go all the way up to L equals 12 and still find the solution at least um, once. Uh, so, so the scaling is better and we can uh, avoid the, uh, the blow up point um, as well for, for, uh, for, uh, for the hardest problems. Um, so how good is the scaling? And, and I'm almost done, Sugi. Um, well, um, we can do a, a data collapse and extract the, the finite size scaling for these problems. And what we find is when we, we do a data collapse to, to this function here, uh, we find that the data on the previous slide can all be collapsed to a single curve. So all, um, all the data I showed on the previous slide is, is represented here on this one universal curve. And there is a, a major problem that arises when we do this, which is it turns out that the exponent D, uh, it's here, it's an exponential to the L to the D, the exponent D is greater than two. And, and the, the reason I say that's very bad noise is because you can convince yourself it's actually not so hard that if you ran a classical algorithm, um, and any classical, it, it, there is a deterministic classical algorithm that would always solve these problems with, with an exponent D that is at most two. So in fact, it turns out that without error correction, the performance of the quantum annealer is worse than a deterministic classical algorithm. And that's not good. This is why we need error correction. And if we do error correction, we reduce the exponent down to below two. It's 1.73 with error correction, again, for the collapse data. Um, and you can also see here the, the vast, sorry, uh, the vast difference in the, uh, the absolute time. Um, so error correction uh, really comes to the rescue here. All right, last slide. Uh, so what, what I've uh, demonstrated and, and, and argued for is this idea of a quantum algorithmic break even. Uh, it is this notion that we can uh, demonstrate uh, error corrected scaling that's better than the uncorrected uh, scaling on a non-trivial computational problem. Um, I've uh, uh, shown you uh, some results that show that this is already achievable in quantum annealing. And of course, the, the next thing I'm working on is to get that curve uh, even below the classical curve. Uh, and uh, if, if we can do that, and we have some encouraging results along those lines with the new generation of DOA machines, uh, then we have algorithmic success in the sense that uh, the error corrected scaling is better than the constant scaling. Okay, and that's it, thank you. Thank you, Daniel, uh, for this wonderful talk. I mean, I think we have time for a couple of questions. And if you have additional questions, just put them in the chat and we will address them um, after Sabra's intervention. Questions? Let me make sure that I see everyone. OK, so Hassan, go ahead. Um, hello. Thank you for great talk. I was just wondering, is that a fundamental reason that you are not going for phase error correction or is she just decided not to go for that? Like there is a lim theoretical limitation on doing that or not? Um, so I presume you're referring to the fact that I was talking about bit flip error correction. Yes. And uh, yeah, so there are, there are a number of reasons. Um, the first reason is a very practical one. It turns out that on these D-wave machines, there is, because there's much more limited control than you have on the, on the gate model machines, there are just a very few things you can actually do to do error correction. Um, so <clears throat> directly correcting for phase errors is just not possible uh, with the knobs that are at our disposal. Um, so that's the, the pragmatic answer. Uh, there's also a more fundamental answer, which is that adiabatic quantum computing is really conceptually different from, uh, from circuit model quantum computing. In the circuit model, you, you have to worry about every single type of error and phase errors are very, very bad. Um, in the adiabatic model, assume that you stayed in the ground state the whole time. A phase error, what is a phase error? A phase error is now uh, an, an, an error that uh, develops between energy eigenstates. Right? So the, the right basis in which to think is the energy eigenbasis, the ground state, the first excited state, second excited state, and so on. So a phase error is now an error uh, between 
the ground state wave function and the, let's say the first excited state wave function, they develop a relative phase and that phase gets scrambled, but it doesn't matter for quantum annealing or for adiabatic, adiabatic quantum computing because we're just interested in the ground state wave function. So you can have phase errors relative to excited states and they won't interfere with the, the result of the computation. So in some sense, um, you don't actually have to worry about them as much as you do in the gate model. So um, thank you so much, Thanks. Daniel. I know that Alan and Sabre, you still have questions. Just, just put them in the chat and we will address them after your talk, Sabre. So it's my pleasure to introduce Sabre Case from Purdue University that will be talking about quantum machine learning for electronic structure. Go ahead, Sabre. Yeah, thank you for organizing this workshop and for inviting me. Uh, and I will talk about uh, quantum machine learning, but before that, since the goal is really to initiate discussion, I thought just to mention quickly the, the other project that our group is involved with. And just briefly, this is only one slide. And we try to study what is the role of entanglement in predicting the outcome of chemical reactions. And in the past, we talked about how quantum coherence and entanglement can help us to understand the uh, like transport phenomena. And today I'll talk about quantum machine learning for electronic structure. And we also involved in how to do finite size scaling in Hilbert space and run it on a quantum computer. And finally is like how to simulate open quantum dynamics, the quantum master equation where you have dissipative term on a quantum machine. So our paper in the archive and you can check the, the website and we can take the discussion offline if there is any interest in these other fields. But I will focus on the quantum machine learning for electronic structure. And for that, maybe we will start, uh, what is the motivation? What is the main problem here? I mean, probably all of us work in this field and probably Alan mentioned this before. I mean, you start with the wave function or density matrix and you know the exponential complexity as the system size increase for this wave function. And the challenge is how to describe the non-trivial correlation encoded in the exponential complexity of the many-body wave function. So if we believe that nature doesn't really explore all possibilities of the corresponding large dimensional Hilbert space, and the question is, how do you discover a subspace in this large dimensional Hilbert space that you have polynomial complexity as the system size increase. Daniel, Daniel talk about the difference between exponential and polynomial for the quantum. But how do we go about this and discover those states that in large Hilbert space that you can reach them with polynomial complexity? And for that, we are taking two different approaches. The first one is analytical approach based on complexity theory. I will just mention the main idea, but I will not talk about this in, in this talk, but I will focus on the more practical one, which is the quantum machine learning and, and particularly based on the Boltzmann statistical physics for this, for this one. Because if you think about the quantum machine learning or machine learning in general, you have large dimensional space and you'd like to reduce it to get useful information. And we use the same idea here. So just briefly, I think in, in, in the first approach for the complexity theory, we try to come up with a quantum state that can be created with a polynomial number of uh, steps or number of qubits as the system size increases. And once we have, we, like we create this complex or maybe maximum entangled state that can be reached with a polynomial number of steps. And then we study the coefficient to see if there's some features there that we can predict or we can take it to other system where we can compare and see if a given states belong to this kind of class. And then we have three, three papers in this field. We are not really, we are not there by solving the problem, but we made a few steps in this direction. And the other one, we studied the same problem in the dual space where you go to the Fourier transform of the qubit space. And again, we're asking the same question for the quantum circuit, how do you reach it with the polynomial number of qubits or uh, gates? So I'll focus on the quantum machine learning, the other project for this talk. And 
I will start by telling you briefly what is restricted post machine. I mean, since we have limited time, I mean, I know many people work in this field, but I'll just focus what, what is our contribution and what, where we're taking this field of research. And then I will show practical or proof of concept that this restricted post machine, you can de design a quantum circuit, run it for small molecular systems like H2, lithium hydride, water, and so on. But more exciting was to get the band structure, balance band and conduction band for two dimensional materials. And then toward the end, if there is time, I will mention how we use this one, the restricted boson machine to look at phase transition on a quantum computer. So I'm sure, I mean, Alan is pioneering the, the work in the field of electronic structure for this system. And just quick summary, maybe we have to update it now. We're talking about theoretical and experimental results for a small system from two to 12 qubits. We have both the theory and the experimental results for all of this. And I missed the first part of the talk by Alan, but I'm sure he talked about the next thing I want to do next. And we have the direction of taking quantum classical hybrid algorithms. And uh, Daniel talked about the D wave and adiabatic quantum algorithms. And here I'll talk about quantum machine learning. And before that, also, we just mentioned for discussion if there's interest, we're trying also to see if we can generalize the, the phase estimation algorithm from the qubit to qubit space. And the idea is to run it because there's advancement in the, in the groups that doing photonic quantum computing. And here we collaborating with the group of Andrew Weiner at Purdue here. And we show the proof of concept that you can use three frequencies. So the dimension was a three here. And we took a simple matrix three by three and we can run the phase estimation algorithm in higher dimensional space. And for those who are interested, we put together a, a review article and this appears in Frontier Physics in collaboration with Barry Sanders, like summarizing what people have done in the QD space, all the algorithms and the different applications. Just like to mention this quickly because uh, Daniel talked about the D-Wave machine. I think a couple of years ago, we also tried to see if we can map electronic structure to something that we can run on the machine. And we succeed to run, to find the transformation that take the Schrodinger equation to, high, to Ising type Hamiltonian, but the price you have to pay, you have to go to high dimensional space with Ancilla qubit. But the exciting thing, they can do this transformation, but it's that the, the, the transformation was not, was not efficient, meaning that in the large dimensional space, it goes exponential with number of qubits. But I mean, the students run it on a, on a D wave and they got the results for these simple systems. But what exciting for us was that with this mapping between Schrodinger and Ising, and we know in Ising type Hamiltonian, you have this rich phase diagram. And the question, what is the equivalent of this in electronic structure? And this probably will take us to maybe 15 years ago when we tried to see if the symmetry breaking in electronic structure configuration, like you knew, ionize the atom or dissociate the molecular system, what is the critical phenomena behind these processes? And we believe that symmetry breaking is really related to critical phenomena. But I thought maybe this is really an, 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 a nice way of connecting the two fields of phase transition or symmetry breaking for electronic structure and the Ising type Hamiltonian from this mapping. So let's get back to machine learning. I just started to distinguish between people sometimes in the literature use quantum machine learning, meaning the running classical machine learning on a quantum data. Here, really, the idea is really to come up with the quantum algorithms and combine it with machine learning. And we talk about quantum, computing, quantum machine learning. But in the field of chemistry, machine learning and deep learning was based on like supervised, unsupervised, or reinforcement has been used in many, many uh, fields of chemistry. And we'll say with many successful results in, in, in all these different applications. And just would like to point out that uh, like a, three weeks ago, we put together a review article on all these different applications, starting with the classical machine learning and how quantum or what people have done 
by adding quantum to this or quantizing this machine learning for application in chemistry and physics. So here we'll focus about the quantum machine learning with, with the restricted Boson machine. And the inspiring work for us to, to go into this direction was the paper by uh, Troyer and, his, uh, and Carlo, and this was in science 2017. They showed that this restricted Boson machine with two layer, visible layer and hidden layer can be used to get the wave function and solve the Ising type Hamiltonian and the Heisenberg or the anti-formagnetic Heisenberg. And I thought, I mean, once we saw this paper, I mean, this is really exciting because now you have a chance to merge three successful fields of research. I mean, we all teach statistical physics and Boltzmann distribution. And then you have the neural, neural network field of research and quantum computing. And the question, if you merge the three, hopefully we can come up with unified approach to solve interesting problem in chemistry and physics. And I just like to point out here at Purdue, we have a beautiful talk by a beautiful, I mean, this was a couple of lectures by my colleague Sabiru Data. And this is also in the NanoHub. You can listen to the, these talks where he talk about the fundamental physics in the three areas. He's not talking about quantum machine learning, but he's going through the physics of these three areas. And machine learning, if you search the literature, it looks like it goes back to 87 or the work by Smolensky and so, so what is the main problem here? I mean, if you start with a system, molecular system, unit cell for materials, spin system, whatever the system, what we do in, in our field of quantum chemistry, we go from the differential equation to a matrix form equation by introducing a basis set. And you turn your equa differential equation into a matrix form and then the problem is very simple. And simple to state it, I mean, you have a, uh, Hermitian matrix with dimensional D, and the question is how do you find the eigenvectors and eigenvalues? And the rest of my talk is based on three, our three papers that we recently published, just in case if I missed, to give you the main idea. And we have supplementary material to go to the, to the, to the, I mean, the, the math behind this approach. So in the first one, we show how quantum Boltzmann machine can be used for electronic structure simple molecular system, and then we extend it to the valence band of two-dimensional materials like graphene and hexagonal nit nitride. And then later we were able to go, it's not only from the ground, also excited states, to go band structure from valence band to the conduction band. So let me just say here, what, what is our main contribution? Because many people work in this field, so just specifically what we are talking about here that we were able really to come up with a quantum circuit that do the Gibbs distribution. And we show that this quantum circuit, the, the, the scaling is really quad quadratic in the resources. And here we talk about the quadratic in, meaning in the, in, the, in the circuit width, depth, and the number of parameters to be optimized in, in, in this search. And we apply it to two dimensional materials and we, in this case, we run it on the IBM quantum computer, both in the simulator and the real machine. And since the system, the Hamiltonian size is small, we were able really to get exact results compared with the exact diagonalization. So I will summarize, I mean, my contribution is really come up with a quantum circuit that do this sampling and it was quadratic, where classically it's exponential with a number of configurations. So what is the restricted Boltzmann machine? You have two, as mentioned, two layers. This is the visible layer. And these nodes takes values one or minus one, and then we'll go for map it to qubit space. So if it's one in, in, in one in qubit in state one and minus one in zero. And we have biases or local fields, a vector of n dimension as the number of nodes. And here the hidden one with the biases with the vector with the M component, and these are the hidden layer, and they are connected by this matrix, the connectivity matrix, with the two indices running over the hidden and the visible. So we can come up with a quantum circuit that do this sampling and get the Boltzmann distribution. And from this, we can get the amplitude of the wave function by just taking the square root. But to get the phase of the wave function, and this is extremely important when you go to boundary condition, we added one more node, we call it the phase node, 
and this is a complex you have the real and imaginary parts and you can see here this complex i mean here they have the nonlinear activation function which is uh, with this complex argument allow you to calculate the phase so now the total wave function at the end that we're trying to simulate is the amplitude and the phase and you sum over all the configuration in the visible in the visible layer. So just briefly, the algorithm you start with the random variable for the parameters here, the parameters local field on both hidden and, and the visible, the connectivity matrix and in the phase node. And where is the quantum part comes in, the quantum part comes in from the assembling, the Gibbs distribution. And then once you have the cost function, which is for us here is the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, the rest will be optimization using classical algorithm. So you can think about it as a hybrid quantum classical algorithm to do electronic structure calculations. I mean, I already mentioned the, the, the mapping to qubit. So let's get to the, the quantum circuit, how the quantum circuit works. You start just for an example, suppose this is the visible layer with, you initiate the, all the qubit in the zero state. And here the visible with two, the hidden with two, and then we need an a qubit. And you'll see in a minute why I need an a qubit. So the first step, you have to put all the visible and the hidden qubit in a, in a superposition. And the way we do it, we take rotation with this angle theta. And the angle theta depends on the parameter. And these parameters are the local fields for the visible and the hidden. And here I just wrote explicitly the matrix for this rotation. So again, you rotate, and the way you rotate these Hamiltonian, I mean, these uh, the, the qubit depends on the parameter and in the quantum circuit. So you put all in the superposition, and then you would like to introduce the connectivity matrix omega i j between layers, the, 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 the visible and the hidden. And for that, we need three qubit gates to have control, control rotation. And you see control control to mix between the hidden and the visible and the rotational, the angle in this rotation omega ij depends on i and j. And for that one, we also connect, I have it here, so, okay. We connect also this angle theta in the control control rotation with the, the number from the connectivity matrix. Also oh, here is the control control. I mean, you see the explicitly and then the theta one and theta two, it depends if it's zero, zero, one, one or zero, one, one, zero. We have four states. So this is the sampling with the, with, the, with the quantum circuit that we have. And this is what we implemented on the IBM machine. So let me, so the other point you have really, we you have to worry about is the successful uh, successful sampling. How many times you have to, to, to do the sampling? And this is where the main issue, but what we have shown in this case, analytically that there is a lower bound for this uh, distribution. If you uh, introduce the parameter K into the distribution and you think, and you think about it as, a, as an effective temperature, but we show this K here, the Kaba that we introduce to the sampling, and then at the end we take this distribution to the power kappa. It has a lower, lower, lower bound. Now, when it comes to the number of qubits and the number of gates, so in this example we have two in the in the visible, two in the in the, the hidden, and four in the ancillary qubit to connect the two layers. And again, since you have control control rotation, you have to break it down into, uh, as I mentioned here before. I mean, I'm sorry. The X gate, so this is, okay, so this is, so this is the breakdown for control control rotation in term of bit flips X gate. So when the students run this calculation on the IBM, first the simulator, and I mean, here's the number of iteration, 30,000 in the simulator, and about 500 on the real machine. Just here, uh, briefly to mention that when we looked at the classical literature, um, and, and Boston machine, there was a proof back, I think this was in 2010. And you can see the restricted Boston machine are hard to approximate, approximately evaluate or simulate. And they come up with this 
that this is an exponential and it's hard really to make it polynomial unless we can see the risk there as you break the, the hierarchical remains and collapsed. So anyway, this is that was from 2010 showing that this sampling is really ex classically a hard problem. And we show it's going like a quadratic in the number of qubits. Again, just to mention the, 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 the cost function is the expectation value of the Hamiltonian here. And first, we run it for simple systems. We show how it works, like for example, H2 and lithium hydride with 12 qubits here, four and eight. And the accuracy is, was better than what we have in chemical accuracy. I mean, it was the 10 to the minus six in these cases. And then we took it to the two dimensional materials. And here where we need the phase because you have to introduce the boundary condition. So we, the students here, Shriari did it for graphene and hexagonal boron nitride using the tight binding Hamiltonian for this case. And here we start with the tight binding and then use Hubbard model. And here the unit cell is only two, two, atoms, two carbon atoms and the same here we have two. So this is a very simple system where the Hamiltonian is four by four with boundary condition. And when we run it on the, the, the quantum simulator, and here's the ground state, which is the valence band here. And you see in the, this is the energy in the, in, the, in the momentum space. And here the green one are from the machine. And you can see this is with error mitigation and you see there's no error here because what we have done, we did what we call the transfer learning method. So we did it at the, at the gamma point where we get convergence and then we use the same results to generate the, the, the next nearer point. So instead of starting at random, where when you start at random, you see the errors are all over the place. And we see the splitting of the, of the, of the band because the, you have spin up and spin down for graphene, both on the simulator and in, in the real machine. Now, just to go to the, to the excited state and the, and the conduction band, now we modified the, the, the cost function to include a penalty term where mean, I mean, the physics of this one, people use this in variational calculation. The, the, the main idea is to project out the ground state from the Hamiltonian. And then once you minimize, you go to the first side state. And my postdoc here, Manas, run it for, for these two dimensional materials, molybdenum disulfide and tungsten disulfide and I mean, we use the tight bonding Hamiltonian to the third ne nearest neighbor. We took the Hamiltonian from the literature here. And we run this calculation and you can see we compare the exact with the classical restricted boss machine on the cousin and on the real machine. And you see the errors is really 10 to the minus six in the simulator and brought 10 to the minus three on, on, on the real machine. So the accuracy was very good comparing with, with, the, with the exact uh, numerical diagonalization. So we need for both materials. And then the question is what, what next? I mean, let me take like a few just minutes just to show where we're going with this approach. And one direction is going really to uh, see if this approach can be used for quantum spin liquid. And for that, we are collaborating. We have a joint project with Professor Arnab Energy from the physics department. He's an experimentalist as looking at the field of quantum spin liquid. I mean, just here to really maybe emphasize what we have done so far, I mean, it's not going to work for a strongly correlated system. I mean, this is, this is very clear. And the question is what modification we have to do to this Boston machine in order to go to really more strongly correlated system. And here when we talk about spin liquid, I mean, these are frustrated system where entanglement is essential to be described by the method. So again, our approach is limited and we don't expect this to work for strongly correlated system and this is, has to be modified. And we were also successful in running it uh, for phase transition. And I will just mention the basic idea. There are where, uh, two interesting articles on the quantum RAPI model where this model, I mean, you have a two-level system interacting with a bosonic mode. And people in this physical review letter, they solve it analytically, the, the, the Martin Plenio, and they show the quantum phase transition is, is a second order transition. 
And what is more exciting that people have done this experiment with trad ion, where the vibrations here are the, the, the degrees of freedom that connected with the two level system and in the hyperfine splitting. So anyway, we thought maybe this is an exciting, it's a small problem, it's a final system, and we can see, look at phase transition with the six boson machine. And this again, the analytical solution showing that the system except uh, second order phase transition. And we were able to use this, the, the, the restricted boson machine and the students done it on the simulator. And now we're collecting data into the quantum, into the IBM real machine. And we're using finite size scaling in Hilbert space or for us in the qubit space to get to the criticality. And we see from the simulator is really converging to the right answer where the coupling parameter or the critical one is one. So just to summarize it quickly, what we have done so far in this one, our main contribution is coming up with a quantum circuit that do this Postman distribution, this one is sampling, and it's a quadratic where classical is exponential. And again, there is a lot of hidden cost in the, in the, in the, in the other parts of this. And it's really it has to be modified for strongly correlated system. And we're trying to see how to push it for more strongly connected system and open dynamics on, 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 on quantum machines. So I'd like to thank again my students here that I mentioned their work when I talked about the different parts of this, of this work. And I would like just to mention one thing here in the funding because now we are involved in Phase one, which is CCI. This is the, the, the Center for Chemical Innovation with NSF, I mean, led by Yale. And I'd like to, this is like a 2010. And since Daniel and Alan here, I'd like to end my talk with this noisy picture that we have the people leading this back in 2010. We have the first CCI. And this picture was taken by Alan. And you can see it's a noisy because we're still in the NISC here. Thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Sabri. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions before moving on to the general discussion. So if anybody in the room has questions. Sabri, what, maybe you can mention what is the CCI about? This is the Center for Chemical Innovation run by NSF. Yes, but uh, what, I mean, what, is the topic, what is the topic of the proposal? Or the second one uh, for us was the chemical information for chemical system and there maybe i'll make it here larger i mean the center is it's more uh, dynamics it's a quantum dynamics and molecular quantum devices so this is run i mean this is led by yale group okay thank you so much so I, I it's, think... it's really nice to see nsf coming back after 10 years and giving another cci so but since Alan and Daniel here, I mean, they are, they were the leader in that time. So uh, I like to mention this. <laughs> okay, I, I, I see that David and Daniel have questions. So go ahead, David. Yeah, just a quick, uh, quick one. You, you mentioned a, a, at a number of points, uh, open quantum system dynamics. And yes. I was just wondering, uh, uh, how are you formulating this? Is it, is it formulated uh, variationally? Is it, is it, no, no, it's just like the way we do it, uh, we're trying to simulate the quantum master equation. So you have two terms. One is the, the, the unitary part, and the problem is the non-unitary part. So what exactly. we did, we took the, the Krauss map, so we run it as a, as, as a Krauss sum operator. So we went from Lindblad to Krauss, uh -huh. and now we use the mathematical theorem to take non-unitary Krauss operator into unitary in higher dimensional space. So these Krauss operators can be turned into unitary in higher dimensional space. And, it's, and the, the, the mathematical theorem is very simple. And once you have it a unitary, you said, okay, I will decompose it now into quantum gates and run it on a quantum computer. Huh. And we show how it works for simple system like uh, amplitude damping. And then we did it for simulating the FE more complex with three sides. And now we're trying with the seven sides FE more complex that many people huh. did calculations before and just quantum simulations. So the main idea is really to, to make the Krauss operator unitary in higher dimensional space. So there is a cost for that, but I mean, this is what we have so far. Thank you. Daniel, go ahead. 
Yeah, so I was uh, just wondering regarding the, the use of the respective Boltzmann machines, uh, uh, you know, those kind of fell out of favor in the classical machine learning community, uh, I don't know, about a decade ago. Um, are, are, you, are you thinking of uh, upgrading to kind of a, a more uh, state-of-the-art uh, neural network type architecture? Yeah, we started with this one now. We're trying to see how to like, uh, like add more layers in this machine and then add more coupling. And what's really worrying me is at this point is how to include entanglement in this process. Because what we have, we have two local Hamiltonian and it's not clear how I will include entanglement in this process. So we thought maybe adding one more layer with higher couplings is going to help us. But I'm not sure if it's a deep learning in this process will help us in, in introducing entanglement in this process. So I'm not, I'm not clear about this point. So this is what we're trying to figure out. If deep learning, I mean more go to deep neural network is going to help us in including entanglement in the process and go for strongly correlated system. So yeah, my understanding is most of the application really has not to do with strong correlated system because we fail in, in just using this simple possible machine. Okay. Brenda, go ahead. My question was similar to Daniel's. Um, so in, in strong, strongly correlated physics, right, there are neural networks like PolyNet and FermiNet. Um, and essentially what you're learning are things like Jastro factors and, and, and constants. So if you can expand beyond the restricted Boltzmann machines, right, you can easily use those techniques for, for strongly correlated systems. Yeah, I think I agree, but I mean, I haven't seen, I mean, maybe there are work that I'm not, I mean, I haven't seen success in really using this quantum machine learning for strongly correlated system. Maybe I'm missing work in this field, but- Oh, no, 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 I, I, I totally agree. Uh, so so those, those are all classical implementations, but if, if one were to go to the quantum regime for those, then, then, then you should in principle be able to do it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, from my perspective, there, there's been a lot of issues with just being able to, to compute those things on a quantum computer and, and you know, see what the scaling and, and, and how that works is. Especially now we are focusing on the spin liquid and entanglement is essential there. I mean, it's like without being able to describe entanglement correctly, I mean, there's no point. Well, you, you have entanglement in the, in the uh, quantum Gibbs uh, distribution that you're sampling from, assuming that it's sufficiently low temperature. So yeah. You know, the uh, question is how, how you can exploit it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because we are thinking with this coupling omega ij is really, you have include higher correlations between the two layer, which might cover some of this, but. Okay, so um, thank you so stop much, Fabri. I think, I, stop I think we have, I think we have a few, we have uh, time for additional questions to all the speakers. So maybe Brenda, Lan, Daniel, if you could just maybe turn on your cameras and uh, be ready for additional discussion, that would be wonderful.